I'd like to invite you this morning to take a Bible and turn to the book of Ruth. If you need a Bible, there's one in the rack in front of you, and that looks something like this. The book of Ruth in the Old Testament is page 210 in these Bibles. And turning to the book of Ruth, let me remind you that as we go through the book of Ruth, it's this great little story in the Old Testament, and I encourage you to read it and read it again and again because it's got such a beautiful, such beautiful themes in it. The basic idea of the story is it's a love story between a man named Boaz and a widow named Ruth. It's also a love story between that same woman, Ruth, and her mother-in-law, Naomi. But more than anything else, it's a love story between God and us. And it's a story about a God who cannot sit idly by while our lives fall apart because of disease, suffering, sin, death, and Satan, and instead chooses to pay whatever price to bring about rescue and restoration, repair, and help in the midst of our times of trouble. It's about a God who rescues us, a God who redeems us, a God whose love for us is so great and so powerful that no matter what we go through, no matter what we journey through, he promises us he will be by our side every step of the way. Last week, we had the opportunity to look at the story of Ruth from the perspective of Naomi, the mother-in-law. And we talked about how Naomi, this wonderful woman, was trapped in enslavement to bitterness. And Heather shared her testimony this morning about how God is still in the business of setting people free from slavery to bitterness. And it is slavery. And when he calls it sin, It's to set you free from the slavery of bitterness. Well, this morning we have the opportunity to look at the story of Ruth from the perspective of Boaz. And I want to encourage you the same way I encouraged you last week with Naomi. Listen to the story of Boaz. And as we talk about this very real person, and we talk about his strengths and his weaknesses, and we talk about what God did for him, I want you to listen and hear your own story, perhaps, in the story of Boaz. Well, we're introduced to this person, Boaz, in chapter 2, verse 1. Would you look there with me? Where we are in the story is Naomi, who's lost her husband and two sons, and Ruth, who was married to one of those sons. These two widows, Naomi and Ruth, have moved back from Moab to Bethlehem just arrived, and Naomi is struggling in the bitterness of hopelessness. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. We find out that this man Boaz that we're talking about this morning is a man of standing. That means that he is economically successful, and that he is socially well off in the community. He's a well-respected member of the town of Bethlehem. His business seems to be going well. The people who work for him, the people who work with him, he has a good reputation with all the people, with the elders and all who are arrived. He is a man of standing. His name is Boaz, which we think means in him is strength. And the picture is, is Boaz is this pillar of the community. He's this strong character. And in fact, in the book of Ruth, we see the strength of Boaz's character in three ways in the story. The first is in chapter 2. In chapter 2, Ruth, who needs some job and some income, goes to glean in the fields of this man, Boaz. Now, it seems random that she ends up there, but we know that God's hand has led her there. And she comes into Boaz's field. Now, in the book of Deuteronomy, in the Mosaic Law, it says this in chapter 24. When you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf of wheat or barley, 
Don't go back and get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat the olives from your trees, don't go over the branches a second time. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, do not go over the vines again. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. This past Monday, our family went strawberry picking. It was great. It was sort of the first day of the season. And so we showed up and the vines were loaded with strawberries. It was fantastic. It was probably the best picking we'd ever done. I think we picked about 80 pounds of strawberries in roughly 50 minutes. We've eaten a lot of strawberries this week. It's been great. But while we were there, the farm that we were at, the people were very kind and friendly, uh, the people who worked there. And I think actually the owner was there kind of on the first day. And we got assigned our strawberry patch vines. They were very gracious to us. Enjoy, enjoy. It's a beautiful harvest. But they, I will say that probably two or three times they came by while we were picking and encouraged us to make sure we didn't leave a single ripe strawberry on the vines where we were picking. And I understand that. It's hard to make money if you're going to leave fruit on a vine. It's difficult. It doesn't make economic sense if you're going to allow people in to pick on your field. If they're not going to pick all of the ripe strawberries, some of those might go to waste. So I completely understand economically it doesn't make any sense to leave fruit there. It didn't make any sense in Israel either (laughs) to go through your vineyard and not collect every grape that you could find or to go through your olive trees and not pick every olive that you could get or to go through the harvest and not pick every sheath of wheat or barley. That doesn't make any economic sense. That's why most people in Boaz's time didn't follow this rule. It's as clear as can be. Is there any doubt about what you're supposed to do if you're a landowner growing things? No doubt whatsoever. But it almost never was followed. Except for the fact that Boaz does. He actually obeys this. Now Ruth, this woman who's coming into his field to glean, she qualifies under two of the three categories. She's a widow, and she's a foreigner. And who knows, she might have been fatherless too. But it was so bad in Israel at this time that because she's a widow and because she's a foreigner, it actually was extremely dangerous for her to go and do what she's doing, which is to go into someone's field and glean. What was going to happen to her? horrifyingly sexual assault. Her mother-in-law acknowledges that when she sends Ruth out to do this. You're going into some danger. Boaz acknowledges, he says, look, basically, if you'd ended up in anybody else's field, you probably would have been assaulted. Stay here with me. I'll make sure that doesn't happen. That's how bad it had gotten in Israel at the time, that the weakest and the most vulnerable who are supposed to be protected... They were the ones being assaulted and taken advantage of. But not on Boaz's farm. Not on Boaz's farm. In fact, he not only obeys the letter of the law, he goes beyond it, passed into the spirit of the law. He says to Ruth when she shows up in his fields to glean as a poor foreign widow, he says to her, why don't you work with my female workers? He's trying to remove the stigma of her gleaning as a poor person. Just work right alongside of them. When it's time for water, he says, go and drink the same water that my workers get to drink. There's nothing in here that says you have to do that, but he does. He invites her to join him and the workers for lunch and shares his hospitality with her. And then... He pulls the workers aside and says, hey, not only let her have the extra, pull some out that you've already picked and leave it for her. That's the strength of Boaz's character. It's good Samaritan-like. 
He's gone way above and beyond to try to provide for this woman who is a widow and a foreigner. Now, I want to be honest. I see that attitude here at Calvary Church all the time. It's so encouraging. I see people here, men and women, who are incredibly generous, who have their hearts set on helping the poor and the fatherless and the widow and the foreigner, who go out of their way to give in tithes or grace beyond or benevolence for or whatever they can do. All you have to do in this church is just simply mention that somebody's in need, and there are so many of you that just want to jump in and get involved and do not only what the Bible says in Deuteronomy, but so much more. That's Boaz. That's that same strength of character. Nobody else is obeying, but Boaz is. And he's gone beyond simple obedience to looking for every possible way he might be a blessing to those who are poor and struggling. The second sort of strength of character that we see in Boaz is in chapter 3. Now, chapter 3 is uh, Boaz's pivotal moment, and so we're going to come back and spend some more time there in just a little bit. But the facts of the matter in chapter 3 is Naomi, the mother-in-law, knows that Ruth and Boaz should be married. And so Naomi says to Ruth, hey, look, you need to help this guy see this. And so she gives her some advice, and the advice is, at night when all the workers have kind of finished working, the male workers would lay down to sleep in the threshing floor so they could be ready to get going at the beginning of the next day. Naomi says to Ruth, when you see them go and do that, at night, go in and uncover Boaz's feet and lay down at his feet. Now, Ruth does that. Where we see the strength of Boaz's character is we're told in the story that sometime in the middle of the night, midnight, one, two, whenever it is, he's startled and wakes up and realizes there's a woman laying at his feet on the threshing floor. The strength of Boaz's character is he does not misinterpret why she's there. Most men would have interpreted this as an opportunity for sexual relationship outside of marriage. It's to Boaz's credit that he does not do that. In fact, the contrast with his great-grandson David could not be more sharp. David, who is also in a position of power and influence, sees a woman who's not laying at his feet. He sees a woman who's in her own house and finds her attractive and uses his position and authority to get her to commit adultery. Here's his great-grandfather who has a woman laying at his feet, and Boaz never once thinks, oh, she's here for sex. He realizes what she's there for. She's there to propose marriage to him, and he does not take advantage of her, even when she's there asking him to marry her. The strength of his moral character. The fact that he will not engage in sexual immorality. I see that same strength in many of you. I look around the society in which we live, and not only is everything sexually permissible, it's encouraged. But I see so many of you refusing to give way to what the world says sexuality ought to look like, and in strength of character, you are obeying God's laws for sexual morality. That's Boaz. This is a strong man who says, not only is he not going to take advantage of the fact that she's come to see him in the middle of the night, He wakes up extra early in the morning to help make sure she's able to get out of the threshing floor without anybody accusing her of sexual immorality, which she didn't do. That's great moral character. The third place we see Boaz's strength of character is in chapter 4. So as the story goes on, so Ruth asked Boaz to marry her. Boaz has agreed, but he says... Look, there's somebody who has a closer relationship to you. And the way this works, it's some complex stuff from the Mosaic Law. But essentially, because Ruth is a widow, those who were related to her husband have an obligation and a responsibility to make sure that she doesn't stay a widow. They're supposed to marry her. 
And what Boaz says is not only is he excited to marry her, but he says, look, there's somebody else who's actually a closer relation than I am. And that person has first right of refusal. Now, the great thing about this guy in chapter four is that literally in Hebrew, he's called Mr. So-and-so. That's literally what he's called. It's the word that we use for and such and such. When you're not really interested in giving the details, that's his name. There was a guy, Mr. So-and-so. He's the closer relation. So what happens in chapter four is Boaz and Mr. So-and-so have a conversation. And Boaz brings to Mr. So-and-so's attention that they have this obligation, but Mr. So-and-so is closer in relation to Ruth than Boaz is. And so Boaz gets the elders together, and he says to Mr. So-and-so, hey, Naomi, who came back from Moab, has a piece of land that she's wanting to sell. Do you want to buy it? You have first right of refusal. Do you want to buy the land? Mr. So-and-so doesn't even bat an eye. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Why? This is a great financial proposition. There's no more famine in the land. Things are going great. He wants to add to his holdings. Why not buy this land? The harvest is great. He sees this as a really excellent economic opportunity for himself. Boaz then says to him, by the way, when you buy the land, you get Ruth, the Moabitess, as your wife. Verse 6 of chapter 4. The moment Mr. So-and-so hears this, he says at this, the guardian redeemer, that's Mr. So-and-so, said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. What's he saying here? Well, all of a sudden, Mr. So-and-so realizes there's some financial complications here. The moment I buy this field, I also inherit Naomi and am now responsible for taking care of her. I also inherit Ruth and am financially obligated for her. And one more thing, if he and Ruth get married and have a son, according to this thing called a Leverite law in the the Mosaic law, the land would actually belong to the child and not to to Mr. So-and-so. And And so again, he doesn't bat an eye. He realizes immediately, whoa, this is a bad deal. (laughs) Like I'm taking on all sorts of obligations here and all I'm getting is a field out of this. And so he says... I don't want to endanger my own estate. He knows it's a bad deal. Who else knows it's a bad financial deal? Boaz. But he doesn't care. He's concerned about Ruth. He wants to marry Ruth. He's not worried about, is this good for the bottom line? This is where you see the strength of Boaz's character is he's concerned about relationships, not about finances. His first thought is not about how to grow his empire. His first thought is about how do I bless this woman? How do I have this woman be part of my life? I love that. I see that same thing around Calvary Church all the time. I see people who are unwilling to take promotions at jobs because it might mean they have to work on Sunday and they prioritize their relationship with God and their relationship with us over their job. I see people all the time who are trying to get out of or willing to get out of or have gotten out of high pressure jobs because they want to spend more time with their family. They prioritize relationships over finances. That's Boaz. This guy's a superstar. I think he's one of the godliest guys in the Old Testament. I think he's this great moral exemplar. He's obeying the Lord, not just in letter, but in spirit. In the tough economic decisions, by faith, he's trusting the Lord to provide. He's refusing to give in to sexual immorality, even when it seemingly is offered to him. He's refusing to prioritize finances and empire and success over relationships. I hope many of you see yourselves in the character Boaz, because I do, I see you in that. But Boaz also has a weakness. He's human. And his weakness shows up in chapter three. 
So let's go back to this incident in the middle of the night and let's try to examine what's going on. And if we're willing to identify ourselves, and rightfully so, with some of Boaz's strengths, we may also need to identify ourselves with Boaz's weakness. Chapter 3, verse 7. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you, he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, do not be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good, let him. Let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. Okay, question. Try to put yourself in this situation. You wake up in the middle of the night, we'll say it's two in the morning, and a woman proposes marriage to you. What do you think your response would be? For me, it would be, uh, can I have a little bit of time to think about this? Right? I mean, it's two in the morning. Why doesn't Boaz need a day or two to process this? Because this is not the first time he's thought about this. There is no way you can wake up at two in the morning and have marriage proposed to you and make a decision in that moment if you've not already given this some serious thought. He already knows that he's a guardian redeemer for her. He's thought about this. He gets the fact that he has an obligation according to the Mosaic law to help her by marrying her. He's thought about this. He's already thought about the fact that there's somebody else who's closer related than he is. He's already thought about the fact that she's a woman of noble character. Boaz has already thought about marrying Ruth a long time before this happens. So why doesn't he ask her to marry him? Because he's afraid. He's afraid of rejection. He's afraid of failure. He's afraid this isn't going to go well. Here's this man with great, strong, moral character. But when it comes to this, he's scared. I mean, look, he's the boss, she's the worker. He's the native born, she's the foreigner. He's the man of standing, she's the widow. And in this culture, he's the man and she's the woman. Who should be doing the asking? Boaz. Why is he not? He's afraid. He's afraid. Please, these are real human beings. They got real stuff going on in their life. It's not hard for me to imagine a guy who's very successful in business, a guy who's well-respected in the community, coming up to a situation where he's afraid to go out on a limb and ask somebody to marry him. Now, why is Boaz afraid? There's three reasons I think he might be afraid. Number one, remember who his mom is. Now, we don't find out who his mom is until we get to the New Testament, but he knows who his mom is. And this is what Jesus' genealogy reveals to us about who Boaz's mom is. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Now, who is Rahab? She's a prostitute. Remember her from the story of Joshua? 
She's the prostitute that hangs out the scarlet thread that helps the spies come in uh, and the armies come into the land. That's Boaz's mom. Now, I got to imagine if your mom was a prostitute, I don't think she still is. She gets married. She seems to be welcomed into the people of God. But you and I both know that just because you become a Christian doesn't mean all the mistakes you made in the past are somehow gone, that there's no scars or wounds. I have to imagine that a man who's going to grow up as the son of a woman who used to be a prostitute that there may either be some social stigma still associated with that from some of the community, or there may be some legacy effects. He may not be very good at relating to women because his mom may not have been very good at relating to him. It's all very possible that Boaz, this son of a prostitute, is great with business and bad with relationships. He's scared of rejection because of his upbringing. It's very possible. We don't know that for sure, but he's a human just like you and I. I'm sure raised in a family where her mom had spent a long number of years being a prostitute had some impact on him. Number two, why is he afraid? Verse 10. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. Why is he afraid to ask her to marry him? He thinks he's too old. And unattractive. Listen, he's thought about this. He's looked at Ruth. He's not marrying Ruth out of obligation. He is enamored with this woman. She's a beautiful woman. She's got noble character. She's a hard worker. She's well respected. He's already run the numbers in his mind and he's come out and said, What would a woman like that ever want to do with me? I mean, come on. He's doing well financially. He's the boss. You would think he's got everything going for him, but he looks at himself and how old he is or whatever it is about himself, and he says, surely that woman would rather be with somebody younger, somebody more attractive. It doesn't matter whether rich or poor. She would never say yes to me. Do you feel that here? Do you hear him saying that? He's scared. He's scared she's not going to want him. Third reason why I think he's afraid. There's somebody else with a closer claim. Again, he's human. If he allows his heart to become attached to this woman, and Mr. So-and-so comes in and says he wants to marry her, he's going to get the carpet pulled out from underneath of him. And Boaz, I think, is trying to, he's human. He's trying to protect himself from that kind of hurt. Look, if his only point was he thought that Ruth needed to be married, he would have a long time ago gone and asked Mr. So-and-so, hey, you're supposed to marry her. Get on with it. He's in a quandary. He wants to marry her but thinks she won't say yes to him. If he goes and talks to Mr. So-and-so and Mr. So-and-so says yes, then the woman he loves ends up married to somebody else. So he does what we all do when we get afraid. Nothing. Nothing. He's just not doing anything. He's not encouraging Mr. So-and-so to marry her, and he's not offering to marry her. He's immobilized by fear. Now, we can understand it. We can relate to it. But what about poor Ruth? She got, she's stuck. So in a very real sense... Boaz is not being obedient to the Lord. He's not helping this woman get married, and he's not willing to ask her to marry him. He's left her in limbo. By all rights, he's supposed to propose to her. He's not doing it out of fear. And as understandable as it is, it's still not right. It's still wrong. So the question is, what does God do in the face of Boaz's fear? How does God respond when Boaz, who's a wonderful, godly man, in this case is not doing the right thing? Well, verse 10. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. Now, I put Ruth 310 up on the screen. Right next to Ruth 220, which was the verse we looked at last week, when we said, what was God's response to Naomi when she found herself in the midst of bitterness? In Ruth 2.20, 
The Lord bless him, Naomi said, Ruth 3.10. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied, Ruth 2.20. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead, Ruth 3.10. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. The word kindness is the same word in both passages. It's the word chesed and it's faithfulness. And what Boaz is acknowledging is that behind Ruth's initiative is the faithfulness of God. That just like with Naomi, God had not stopped showing his kindness, so God responds to Boaz's immobilization through fear, not with anger, but with kindness. Essentially what God does is he sees that Boaz, this good godly man, simply can't get past this fear of rejection, and so God encourages Ruth to go ask him. I just love the way this works. He has Ruth randomly end up in the one field in all of Bethlehem where she's going to be taken care of, in the one field where the guy who is related to her can marry her. He uses that act of kindness to remove the weeds from Naomi's eyes so now she can see, hey, look, you two are missing this. God wants the two of you married. Naomi realizes Boaz is too afraid to ask. And so she says to Ruth, you have to take the initiative. And when it happens, Boaz knows immediately, this is God. God has orchestrated this. God in his kindness has seen me in this place immobilized by fear. And instead of sitting back and demanding that Boaz overcome it, God simply met him with kindness. Now last week, I gave you the opportunity that if you're struggling with bitterness and you needed to do some weeding, that we were going to take some time uh, during some singing, about 10 minutes, do the same today, and give you the opportunity to deal with that. We're going to do that this morning, but there are two different groups of people or similar groups of people that I'm going to invite to come down during the next 10 minutes or so. The first, if you're here, and there's been something that the Lord has been asking you to do, sharing the gospel with somebody, quitting your job, trusting him in my faith, getting going on a ministry he wants you to be doing, selling your house, moving to a new place, something that you know the Lord wants you to do, but you've been immobilized by fear. You just can't see how this is going to happen, and so you did nothing. But God, in his kindness, met you in that fear and pulled you forward. I want to give you the opportunity to come forward and kneel during these songs and say thank you. Thank you to a God who did not abandon you to fear and to doubt, but instead was gracious to you and let someone else take the initiative, let something else happen. Maybe you were supposed to quit your job and you just couldn't do it and then you ended up losing your job. That's the kindness of God to spur you on to do the thing he wanted you to do. Maybe you were supposed to be in a relationship with someone and you were unable to get yourself to the point of asking for that relationship to start. And so God let that person ask you, whatever it may be, if this is your situation, I want to give you the opportunity to come and say thank you. Second, if you're in the situation where the Lord is asking you to do something and you simply are immobilized by fear, he's asking you to confront somebody and you just, for the life of you, can't do it. He's asking you to sell some possession and to trust him with those finances and you just can't do it. He's asked you to go on a journey, a health journey, and you just, you can't find yourself able to go on it with him, whatever it may be. I want to give you the opportunity to come down on these steps. And just simply ask him to be kind to you. Ask him to give you something, to give you the courage to go forward. Now you say, well, why do you have to come down to do the steps? Please. Fear is just as enslaving as bitterness. And there's something about standing up and coming forward. Now look, if I said if you're afraid of something, come forward, everyone would be here. We're all afraid of something. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if today... You feel immobilized by fear to do something God is asking you to do, and you need to come and confess that to him and ask him to show you kindness. That's what this is for. Last week was about bitterness. That wasn't me at that moment last week. I didn't come forward. 
This week is about fear. That's me. I already knew I had to come forward long before I wrote this sermon. If it's you, we want to give you the opportunity. We have a, two songs we're going to sing, about 10 minutes. Please, as the Lord leads on your heart, come and do business with the Lord. He wants to set you free from slavery to fear. And he does it by being kind. Let him show you that kindness.